Gaming has the power to tell stories that put the player at the center of the action, and great games match compelling narratives with a rewarding play loop. You can have a great loop with no story, you can have a great story with no play mechanics, but this series examines when storytelling and gameplay come together to form an unforgettable experience for players. This is why it works, when narrative and gameplay align. The mid-2010s brought a wave of survival sandbox games spawned by the rise of early access builds and the popularity of Minecraft, where the player is dropped into a formidable environment, expected to grab materials, fight up hostile creatures, build a home base, craft better tools and equipment, and then just keep doing that for eternity or until you get bored, and that's the game. There are notable exceptions where stories were added after a game's release, such as your plane going down over the Canadian forest in the long dark, or the journey to the eventually redeemed universe in No Man's Sky. Even Terraria got lore through flavor text, but most offered little justification for why this experience needed to exist in the first place. Seven Days to Die is a survival crafting game set in a zombie apocalypse along the lines of DayZ. Poor optimization, terrible controls, and poor graphics burying its otherwise good ideas. Instead, letting mods or multiplayer modes facilitate a sandbox for their audience to build in. Players were instructed to create their own stories, which is really shorthand for create a story because we didn't. So what made Subnautica? A small early access title from unknown worlds where you start as an astronaut not escaping a crashing spaceship, the exception. When the original Disneyland opened in 1955, guests entered the park at the south end of Main Street to be funneled through all the snack vendors and souvenir shops. So Walt Disney placed Sleeping Beauty's castle at the north end of Main Street, beckoned guests forward into the park. From there, paths sent attendees off in all directions, but at Disneyland, your journey begins with a castle looming ahead of you, inviting you to explore it. In Subnautica, your journey begins by the wrecked aurora looming ahead of you, engulfed in flames. You've landed on a planet covered entirely by water, with no sign of other survivors and only your life pod and the aurora floating above the ocean below. Spoilers here on out for the early to mid game in Subnautica. If you're intrigued by survival games, stop watching, play the game, and then come back. Trust me. Your life pod contains a few nutrient bars and a day's worth of drinkable water, so waiting around for a rescue isn't an option. Rescue operation on dispatch to Nine, nine, nine hours. You're gonna need to reach the Aurora to call for help. When you get close, your Geiger counter goes off and warns you radiation is leaking out of the wreckage. So you can't reach the Aurora without protective gear, which you don't have. What you do have is a fabricator on your life pod, which can craft food from organic materials like plants and fish, and tools from minerals and scrap from the ship. Your PDA downloads a schematic for a radiation-free dive suit, and now you're free to explore the early game area known as the Safe Shallows, a relatively friendly zone rich in materials and fish to sustain you while you craft your way to a radiation suit. So Subnautica drops you into a formidable environment where you're expected to ward off hostile creatures, craft upgrades, and build a- Hey, wait a minute, I thought I said this was different from the other games. It is, I'll tell you how. While many survival sandbox games like Darkwood or Don't Starve rely on procedurally generated maps to deliver replayability, Subnautica's digital playground is almost entirely hand-built, with only some variations in the life pod's original position or where non-essential loot is scattered. While that may have sacrificed on variety, Subnautica's designers had enough confidence in the world they created to build one planet and design your progression around it. Speaking of progression, like most survival sandboxes, Subnautica's story is driven by what the player can craft, which unlocks new abilities. Actorio and Stardew Valley are two of PC games gaming's most notorious time thieves, and both drive the player through a series of consistent micro-improvements, allowing them to grow more vegetables or construct more science packs than they did yesterday, which in turn opens up new abilities to grind for. As you're exploring in Subnautica, your life pod radio receives distress calls from other survivors who are trapped or worse. You track their coordinates, but each life pod is empty, ominously ripped open with no human remains to be found. What's left behind are audio diaries with clues and supplies to scavenge, and new items your scanner can analyze. Whatever you scan adds to the tech tree in your fabricator, breadcrumbing progression seamlessly by spreading around around the keys to your next upgrade, waiting for you to find them, but not rushing you forward, allowing you to drive the story at any pace you choose. However, the Aurora's drive core continues to break down, leaking more radiation into the sea around you and threatening to explode. You can only ignore it for so long before it's time to return to your wrecked ship and prevent the core going into meltdown. Enemies vary across the survival sandbox genre, from State of Decay's Army of Zombies to the Cannibals in the Forest. You may be able to avoid them temporarily, but you level up your survivor's skills and capture new territory by invading their zones and making them yours, or slaughtering them for food and supplies. Most of the marine life in the safe shallows is indifferent to you, and the few who acknowledge you are more territorial than hostile. You invade their space, they may respond, but if you leave, they rarely follow you, with the exception of the crash fish who pop up out of their caves to chase you, but they leave a valuable material in their nest you can collect later. You hardly ever die in the safe shallows, and if you do, you'll wake up washed into the life pod, minus a few materials you dropped on death, which are easy to go back and collect. 
Much of the tension in Subnautica's early game comes not from what will attack you, but what might attack you. This game is dripping with ominous sound design, from your oxygen tank breathing, to the responses of each animal when you get too close, to the size of the creatures present here. Reefbacks are so large they just ignore you. What could you possibly do to that thing without a nuke? And finally, there's the far off roar of... something else. Even if you can't see them, it's clear there are other more ferocious creatures out there not too far from you. And if they find you, you won't have many options for combat because you aren't asked to hunt the marine life in Subnautica. You will gain some defensive capabilities, and the creatures here do have HP values you can grind down to zero, but other than catching small fish for food, killing offers no real benefit here. Your job is to exist among the creatures, not make them extinct. And one of Subnautica's greatest strengths is taking that existence and making it fun. When you're let loose on the safe shallows, there's nothing to collect above water, so you have just 45 seconds to dive beneath the surface and scrounge anything you can to sustain your appetite and build better gear before you come back up for air. That's not much, and this is the first mechanic Subnautica does really well. Every meaningful action is a race against time. It's you versus your remaining oxygen. So you have to carefully plan each dive and resurface because that clock is always ticking. As you scan, break, and snatch everything not nailed down, you'll fabricate fins in a tank to move faster, dive longer, and leave the safety of the shallows for deeper waters. And that's the second game mechanic that sets Subnautica apart. Progress in this game is about always going deeper. As those distress calls pour in, they're stuck further and further below the surface, and even your first submersible has a crush depth of 200 meters, which you can dive beneath without decompression because water pressure isn't a thing here. But oxygen depletes faster the deeper you go, making every second count as you rush from your objective back to your Seamoth. So you build and upgrade vehicles that can send you even further below and construct a sprawling base to sustain you while you seek out new material-rich biomes deep into the abyss. But as you and your scanner capture everything you come across, you'll realize you can even scan yourself. Although you might not like what you find, your PDA, which deemed you healthy after the crash, has detected a new form of bacteria, and you're infected. Discoveries in Subnautica always lead to new questions. What's this purple tablet doing here? What are these vents on the ocean floor? Why have all the life pods you found been ripped open with no survivors? And then you pick up a radio message you aren't supposed to hear. Nine new biological subjects designated mode. Hunting. Analyzing. And you get your answer. You're not actually alone here. And that's the third feature Subnautica excels at, creating a game world so fun to traverse that you never notice the darker story sneaking up on you, which worked so well in that other physics-based game everybody loved. This was a triumph. When Portal unleashed test subjects into Aperture Science back in 2007, players were so enamored with the movement physics and GLaDOS's witty dialogue, it wasn't until late in the game, when they found the scrawlings of a former test subject hidden in the walls, that they realized their assumptions about this world might be wrong, and they were in more danger than they thought. If you're watching the world around you in Subnautica, you might notice a few sentient creatures out of the corner of your eye before they blink out, and those creatures are hunting you and your crewmates. So after repairing the Aurora's drive core and stemming the radiation leak, when all seems lost, Hope seeps in through the radio. We're now en route to your location. We're gonna bring you home. Sunbeam out. A passing ship reads the Aurora's distress call and picks a nearby patch of land to meet you on. But there is no patch of land on this world, or is there? Following the Sunbeam's coordinates, you find an island obscured by clouds with a huge alien building reaching high into the sky. So you sit patiently and wait to be rescued. Eight. It's coming from the building? Change course. Set thrusters to full. Many of Subnautica's peers have no end state at all. Others do, but the gameplay loop is so much stronger than the story that players sometimes forget it exists. In those games, you never get rescued. You never find your way home. You just eventually move on to another game and leave your journey unfinished. Subnautica, however, has a properly defined conflict. Something doesn't want you to leave this planet. What are you? Exploring the alien stronghold reveals what you feared. The bacteria you're infected with is from here, and whatever lives on this planet placed it under quarantine. If you build yourself a rocket, it'll be blown out of the sky too, so you need to lift the lockdown before you can escape. Lucky for you, there's a clue in the stronghold about the location of disease research facilities on this planet. Unlucky for you, they're at 800 and 1200 meters below sea level, and your submersible only goes 200 meters down. The key to solving this mystery lies in the crevasses and trenches of Subnautica. 
where the light can't travel, your nerves tremble, and the creatures are more hostile. So you'll have to go much deeper to find the key to ending the quarantine if you ever want to leave this planet alive. Subnautica presents a passive narrative full of powerful imagery, rich mechanics that add tension to every dive, and a pervasive sense of dread that builds as the story sends you deeper and deeper below the surface. And that is why it works. Thanks so much for watching. I'll be streaming Subnautica on Twitch this week, so click the link to my channel below. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe on YouTube. I'm new here, that really does help me out. Have you played Below Zero yet, the new expansion for Subnautica that's currently in early access? If so, let me know what you thought in the comments. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.